Welcome to the second presentation in your Distinguished Speakers Program. Let me set the context that today's talk falls in. The Distinguished Speakers Program, a year-long program of the Associated Students, will be presenting a number of events which constitute examinations of freedom of expression in America today. Henry Luce, the editor of Time, will be speaking here in the spring semester, for instance. Roger Arnberg, the city attorney of Los Angeles, will be speaking here one week from today in the Distinguished Speakers Program. Shelley Berman, a comedian, will be speaking here next Monday in the Speakers Program. Mr. Arnberg will be discussing pornography and the law. Shelley Berman has called his speech puritanical hamstringing of contemporary American humor. So, Mr. Arnberg, Mr. Luce, Mr. Berman, and today's speaker, publisher Ralph Ginsburg, all being presented in an effort to take a critical look at freedom of expression in the United States today. Now, today's presentation and next week's presentation by Mr. Arnberg will be moderated by an eminent member of the faculty of law at UCLA, whom I present to you now, Dr. Arvo Van Alstein. The announcement that Mr. Ralph Ginsburg would speak on campus today has aroused controversy, consternation, and even condemnation. It's a credit to the university, I believe, and a reflection of its considered and strongly held commitment to free exchange of ideas that this program is going forward as planned. The fact that it seems central to the criticism which the university has received in this connection is that Mr. Ginsburg was convicted last June in a federal court in Philadelphia of the crime of using the mails to distribute obscene matter. For from this fact, the self-appointed censors have played upon two themes. First, it has been argued that pornography is not a fit subject for discussion among students in the academic community. To some, it seems the university is not a fit environment for the exploration of all ideas, but only of some ideas. Evidently, the university is believed by these people to have an obligation to recognize that certain topics are beyond the permissible bounds of public discussion. Whether they be treated with objectivity and good taste seems to be of no import. Some ideas, according to these critics, are in the class of what Senator Fulbright in a notable speech last spring referred to as the growing category of unthinkable thoughts. This is neither the occasion nor do we have the time for a full answer to this untenable position. A short answer, however, deserves to be repeated in the words of President Clark Kerr. The university does not seek to make ideas safe for the student, but to make students safe for ideas. In any event, in any event, this criticism is founded on a misconception. Mr. Ginsburg is not here to discuss pornography, much less to illustrate a talk on that subject with Lord Slides. Uh, any of you who may be here under a similar misconception may now be free to leave. Secondly, our critics have also taken the position that as a matter of public morality, a convicted pornographer should not be permitted to speak on any topic on the university campus. Those who advance this view seem to be singularly unsensitive to the fact that Mr. Ginsburg's conviction has not become final, that it is now pending on appeal, and that there is a possibility, indeed a probability, that it may be reversed. One of the critics was even quoted in the press as declaring that this program today must be canceled, quote, if we are to be a governed people, end quote. I would uh, <laughs> hazard the speculation that after Mr. Ginsburg has spoken, we will still be a governed people and hopefully a better informed people also. The qualifications of a speaker, I would suggest, should best be evaluated in relation to his subject matter. One seeking an informed lecture on ornithology, for example, might recently have been acting in a rational fashion and seeking the services of that convicted murderer known as the Birdman of Alcatraz, a man named Stroud, widely recognized as an expert in the field of ornithology. Our speaker today is equipped by experience and investigation to discuss his selected topic, which relates to freedom and independence of the press. Mr. Ralph Ginsburg has worked as a newspaper man in both New York and Washington, as a freelance photographer in Paris. He has been a staff writer for the National Broadcasting Company, an articles editor for Esquire magazine, a member of Look Magazine's managing board, contributor to some 20 magazines from Reader's Digest to Playboy to Harper's. 
He's the author of two books. He has published Eros, a quarterly on, quote, the joys of love, end quote, and he now publishes Fact Magazine. I give you Mr. Ralph Ginsberg. Thank you. I stand before you today, a convicted criminal, sentenced to prison for five years and fined $42,000 for having published a magazine called Eros. Eros was a magazine containing works dealing with love and sex created by the greatest artists and writers of all time and presented with a level of maturity and candor hitherto unknown in American publishing. Uh, when the magazine was first conceived, it was my hope that most people would recognize that this is not, or that Eros is not obscene in the guilt-ridden kind of smirking way that you usually find sex in American publications, rather that Eros would be recognized as, if anything, an antidote to obscenity. We did not dwell upon psychopathology as sexology does, for example, and with all due respects to Playboy, which I think performs an important function, Eros was on a more adult level. There was to be no mailing of Eros in plain brown wrappers, and as a matter of fact, our ads stated so. It was a hardcover magazine selling for $25 a year, and uh, it was more expensively produced in terms of printing, etc., than any other publication on the American scene. We commenced publication of Eros in the spring of 1962, and in the first year published the paintings of Rodin, Raphael, Rubens, Titian, Michelangelo, Rembrandt, Toulouse-Lautrec, the poetry of Ovid, Robert Burns, and the Earl of Rochester and Shakespeare, the humor of Mark Twain, the satire of Aristophanes, the fiction of de Maupassant, Frank Harris, and D.H. Lawrence, and modern contributors included Salvador Dali, Picasso, Norman Mailer, Ray Bradbury, Santa Rama Rao, Elliot Ellisoff, and Bert Stern, Professor Eric Partridge, Dr. Theodore Reich, and Allen Ginsberg. In Eros, we were first to publish quite a number of suppressed classics, including Robert Burns' Merry Muse of Caledonia, Frank Harris's My Life and Loves, and even Fanny Hill. And Instantly, the worlds of art and letters applauded Eros and enjoyed the magazine. I'd like to quote, if I may, a couple of critical reviews of the magazine. Saturday Review said, Eros is a lavish production full of classical references and art. It is likely to become known as the American heritage of the bedroom. <laughs> Variety said, it's, Eros is a well-made magazine evidencing much research. It may replace bachelor etchings. Business Week said Eros was for readers of above average education, and the San Francisco Chronicle said what Eros does is to take the fig leaves off statues, and there's nothing wrong with that. Eros is produced handsomely indeed and should become a status symbol on the coffee tables of our society. The London Mirror said anyone who thinks that love and sex are dirty will think Eros is a dirty magazine, but in essence it is a highbrow magazine which reveals everything about love and sex in the most artistic and tasteful manner. And finally, the Galveston News said, Eros is a welcome antidote to the cheap and degrading periodicals to which love and sex have traditionally been relegated in this country. Newsweek said, Eros is handsome and it will raise eyebrows, but its articles are sincere attempts to convey the tenderness of love, and in essence, the magazine is not smut for smut's sake. Now, during the first year of our publication, the magazine won an inordinate number of awards for design excellence, in fact, a greater number of medals, awards, and citations during its first year of publication than any other magazine in the country. And this despite the fact that Eros was published only quarterly, and despite the fact that it was up against opposition from such handsome magazines as Show, Esquire, Fortune, Holiday, Horizon, etc. Eros's art director, Herb Luballin, was selected as art director of the year. And among the organizations that gave us awards, I don't want to belabor this too much, were the American Society of Illustrators, the Art Directors Club of New York, the annual graphic art show, etc. Even the United States government, at least one part of it, the State Department, recognized the artistic merit of Eros and selected a series of photographs that we ran of an interracial couple making love for inclusion 
in a, an exhibition of the best of American graphic arts, which was sent overseas to Moscow to enhance the American image abroad. <laughs> At the last minute, and for reasons that you will understand later, the, uh, we, we were dropped from the exhibition. Uh, Eros's subscribership included virtually every major university and reference library in the country, and one of our first subscriptions came from the Library of Congress itself. At the St. George School in Newport, Rhode Island, which some people regard as perhaps the finest prep school in the country, an issue of Eros was used as a textbook in a course on living religions. Specifically, a series of photographs of the erotic sculpture of India were used in this course. Now, in addition to being an artistic success, if one can measure such a thing, Eros was a great commercial success. Uh, when I originally conceived of the magazine, I never expected it to exceed a circulation of 25,000. To put that into context, that's about as large as the Nation magazine. But by the end of our first year of publication, we had sold nearly 150,000 subscriptions and had grossed nearly $3 million. For a specialty magazine, this was a bit of an achievement. But there is a rule in the behavioral sciences, as in the physical, as in physics, that for each action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And the appearance of a magazine that treated love and sex candidly was not to be met without a great deal of opposition. It began with the Citizens for Decent Literature. <laughs> a misnomer if I ever heard one. The Citizens for Decent Literature, as you probably know, is a nationwide organization of smut hunters. And the New York chapter is particularly vigorous. It bombarded the few magazines and newspapers that we'd been able to get ads for Eros into, and sure enough, we got booted out. Then, through some kind of connections which they have in the mail order industry, they cut right at our lifeline and began to have withdrawn from our usage several of the key mailing lists upon which the existence and the the life of Eros magazine depended, specifically those of American Heritage, Horizon, and similar quality magazines to, which, to whose subscriberships we had been selling Eros. They even got a couple of printers to drop, uh, to stop printing certain sections of the magazine, and through connections in Washington, got the post office to drag its feet on accepting Eros under second class pending mail privileges. We had to go to court to sue for an injunction to compel the postmaster to take the magazine at second class pending rates, and the post office, realizing it didn't have a leg to stand on, backed off before the case actually came to trial. Finally, they persuaded the district attorney of New York City, Frank Hogan, to present the magazine to a grand jury to find out if it was obscene. And a whole parade of our contributors, including many distinguished people I named to you earlier, were brought before the grand jury and asked whether or not they thought the magazine was obscene. I myself made an appearance before the grand jury, and told him why I thought it was a worthwhile and important magazine. And we won, partly through the help of the district attorney, who was such a damn fool that he put a bunch of photographs in front of, uh, etchings in front of me and asked me, they had run in the magazine, if I didn't think they were really obscene. Now tell us the truth, Mr. Ginsburg. <laughs> yeah. Well, it turned out they were by Rembrandt. <laughs> Anyways, I say we won, but the smart hunters are kind of tireless. And, uh, they continued to harass us. About once a week, we'd get some kind of a cop come up to the office and say, we just want to look around, and they'd turn over papers and ask us, do you ever bring prostitutes up here to photograph them? And they would call my wife and ask all kinds of silly questions over the phone and, and personally annoy me more than anything else. For example, one time when my wife was quite ill, they had her. A guy called up and said, hi, my name's Ralph Hattersley. I took a series of photographs for, fact, for Eros, and uh, your, uh, your husband told me to call and ask you to look in his closet for the ones which he wasn't able to publish because they were too dirty. And he, uh, be sure you, you find those pictures because I need them. They're worth a lot of money to me, and I must get them immediately. And I had my wife, who was then ill, uh, turn over a lot of packages looking for pictures, which, of course, were never there. And as a matter of fact, she had a hemorrhage as a result of it. But this is the kind of harassment that we had. Still, Eros continued to prosper, but then the boom was lowered. Somehow, the forces of censorship, possibly through the offices of Cardinal Spellman in New York, reached Bobby Kennedy in Washington. Now, New York is a, a pretty liberal community with respect to the 
allowing publishers to say what they like about sex or politics or what have you. And the forces of censorship realized that if they were going to get a conviction on Eros, they would have to do it outside of New York. Just prior to this time, there had been an amendment to the federal obscenity statute. It's called the Comstock Act, which is the principal federal criminal statute, which allowed for the indictment of a publisher at any point in the United States through which his publications travel. Until that time, it was only in the city where the publications were mailed that one could be indicted. And so, forces of censorship prevail upon Bobby Kennedy to put Eros before another grand jury, only this time in Philadelphia. Now, I don't know how many people here are from Philadelphia, but Philadelphia is really a pretty stuffy town. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, Bobby Kennedy was successful in this move. I might point out that up until that time, the procedure of the federal government in attempting to banning a book for obscenity was to, um, was to simply ban the book from the mails, as in the Lady Chatterley's Lover case, for example. The postmaster did not attempt to imprison Barney Rossett, the president of Grove Press, for having published Lady Chatterley's Lover. He only wanted to ban the book. But in my case, Bobby Kennedy and the forces of censorship felt some heavier armament, I suppose, was in order, and they proceeded to get me indicted under this federal criminal statute. On December 19, 1962, when our art director was down in Philadelphia being honored by the Pennsylvania Art Directors Club, and during the midst of our office Christmas party, the United States Marshal walked in, <laughs> put the handcuffs on me, and took me off to the courthouse. I was confident of victory. I thought we had had the precedent of a victory before a New York grand jury. And after conferences with my attorney, we decided to move at full speed and get this nuisance over with. We decided we waived the jury. We didn't want to waste the time of impaneling a jury. We figured we'd go into that courtroom and have the case thrown out. The trial opened June 10th of last year. The government had virtually no case at all. It presented about three witnesses, including two psychiatrists, who said they thought Eros was obscene. We presented statements from 65 psychiatrists, plus some clergymen, scholars, artists, and writers, including a Nobel laureate, stating that they did not think Eros was obscene, and that, on the contrary, the magazine had distinct literary merit and was a valuable contribution to the literature of our times. Professor Horst Jansen of NYU, perhaps the foremost art historian in the nation said that Eros in design was the equal of, quote, any magazine published anywhere in the world, end quote. And Dwight McDonald, the literary critic, who said he had misgivings about a number of the pieces in Eros, that, that, but that overall the magazine did have literary merit. The American Civil Liberties Union also filed an amicus brief in our behalf saying that under, under the Supreme Court definition of obscenity, Eros had every right to be published. But all our, all our argument and the arguments of our supporters were to no avail. We had not reckoned with the judge hearing the case. His name was Ralph C. Boddy, <laughs> spelled B-O-D-Y. It was clear from the outset that Boddy had very strong personal feelings about sex in print, and he just couldn't wait to ship me off to prison. When the U.S. attorney presented an exceedingly lame case, as he did, the judge took the extraordinary procedure of prosecuting the case for the government from the bench, waving his finger in the face of defense witnesses and turning crimson every time my attorneys objected to this procedure. It was, therefore, no surprise when on June 14th he found me guilty on all counts and sentenced me to five years in prison and $42,000 in fines. Fortunately, the judge was so blinded by his prejudices and by his eagerness to send me to the clink that he made some unpardonable errors in conducting the trial, and on the basis of these, I am confident of reversal. If not in the United States court, where, as Professor von Alstein said, the case has already been argued and we are waiting for a decision any day now, certainly we will win before the United States Supreme Court. Let me give you a couple examples of this. For example, Judge Boddy threw out the testimony of many of, the, of our psychiatrists, but permitted those of the government to stay in. And perhaps most illustrative of his frame of mind was the fact that he admitted inadvertently toward the end of the trial 
that he had failed to read certain documents upon which he had ruled earlier in the trial. That is to say, he ruled on papers which he hadn't even read. So, as I say, I'm confident of reversal on these technicalities, if not on the patent injustice of the decision itself. Now, I was disappointed by all this, but not entirely shocked. As we know, there are miscarriages of justice in our courts every day, and uh, I was prepared for this possibility. That's why we have appeals courts, at least for those of us who can afford them. But the one thing I had counted on for support and to point out the travesty of justice in this case was the great American press. I couldn't have been more mistaken. To begin with, the press gave the trial hardly any attention at all, and when it did, the coverage was so distorted that anyone who had seen, had been in court for the trial and then read about it in the papers would have thought he was reading about two different trials. Despite the fact that adequate notice was given to both the AP and the UPI and the Philadelphia Bulletin and the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia News and the New York Times, Herald Tribune, Daily News, New York Post, Journal American, World Telegram and Sun, Time and Newsweek, CBS, NBC and ABC and every single radio station in Philadelphia and in New York, only one newsman covered the trial. And he was not there for more than 25 percent of the time. He was the reporter for the Associated Press. His stories read as though he were a paid propagandist for the post office. For example, the government's chief witness was a Philadelphia prison psychiatrist named Frignito. My lawyers questioned him about certain books to find out what his frame of mind was on obscenity. They asked him, for example, had he read Tropic of Cancer and did he think it was obscene? He said he had read it and he did not think it was an obscene book. My lawyers thereupon produced testimony that he made in the trial of tropical cancer in the very same city in Philadelphia. He's the standard government witness who was used against all <laughs> publishers in the city of Philadelphia. And lo and behold, he had read Tropic of Cancer indeed, but on, in that trial he thought it was a dirty book. Sim in other similar ways, my attorneys proved that Frignito was a liar worse, a perjurer. In fact, they so completely castrated him that he had to practically be taken off the witness stand in a stretcher. <laughs> Not one word of this appeared in the press the next day. Instead, the day's AP story led off with Frignito's statement that Eros was so perverted it would disturb even mental patients. <laughs> Whenever the judge or the U.S. attorney described me as an unconscionable wretch who would pervert children in order to make a fast buck, this got big coverage. But when my lawyers introduced evidence to show that I had invested virtually my last cent to make Eros as glorious a book as I could possibly make it, and that I had drawn almost no salary at all, it was unmentioned in the press. It has been said that the motto of the American press is, never kick a man when he's up. And certainly, this proved true in my trial. On the second day, when I saw what kind of coverage this Philadelphia prig was sending out, I called the managing editor of the New York Times, the general manager of the Associated Press, and all the aforementioned media pleading for a fair shake. All I got was deaf ears. Now, not even such respected literary periodicals as the New York Times Book Review or the Saturday Review printed a word concerning this case, although it involves such precious free speech and free press issues. Instead, and this was after the trial was over, the press brayed as follows. For example, the Brooklyn Tablet ran a story headline, How Postal Sleuths Track Down the King of Pornography. <laughs> The Washington Star carried an interview with a postal inspector who said he had detected or discovered a young girl of 12 years old saving up for a copy of Eros. <laughs> and the United States, tre the treasurer of the United States, Catherine Granahan, was quoted in the Philadelphia Bulletin as saying that in publishing Eros, I was part of an international communist apparatus <laughs> to undermine the morals of American youth. <laughs> Finally, there was dear old Time Magazine, the grand jackal of journalism.
Times said the post office didn't really want to suppress Eros. I had practically forced them into it. Readers of Time were told that copies of Eros had been mailed from such places as Middlesex, New Jersey, <laughs> Intercourse, Pennsylvania, <laughs> and Blue Balls, Pennsylvania. <laughs> now the truth of the matter is that Eros was never, ever mailed from any place but Scranton. <laughs> what is more, what is more, any time reader who took the trouble to check a gazetteer would have found there is no such place as Blue Balls, Pennsylvania. <laughs> time used my conviction as an opportunity to t get off a dirty joke at my expense. Well, you can imagine how I felt by the end of the trial. The AP guy couldn't look me in the eye. I was still hopeful that he'd take a snip of what I had to say and send it over the wires of the country. And on the last day of the trial, prior to the sentencing, I prepared a statement, a printed statement, a typewritten statement, make it easy for him so he wouldn't have to look at me. <laughs> In it I said I had felt privileged to defend free speech and that I was confident of eventual vindication. I pointed out that important ideas and great literature invariably survived the best efforts of smut hunters and that I was anything but ashamed of what I had done. On the contrary, I was downright proud of Eros. I pointed out that I thought obscenity was neither measurable nor definable nor worthy of the law. And I also pointed to the parallel between what I think we may accurately describe as the twin superstitions of obscenity and witchery. And I said that I thought the proceedings in the courtroom would live in infamy along with those of the Spanish Inquisition and the Salem witch hunts. <laughs> I pointed up the irony of a society which permits the portrayal of every kind of bloodlust and murder and slaughter and carnage, but which maintains a strict taboo against the depiction of the creation of life itself. And finally, I said that I was confident that future generations of Americans would look back with remorse and real shame at the proceedings of my trial. Not a word of this was used. What the AP sent out was more quotation from the judge and the U.S. attorney saying that I was a publisher of dirt for dirt's sake who had no concern for the youth of the nation and the sanctity of our mailboxes must be preserved. <laughs> and that he was giving me this sentence because he wanted to discourage any other pornographer from following a similar wayward path. Only one news medium gave me anything resembling a fair shake and that was Newsweek which had sent a reporter down for one day of the five-day trial. Newsweek's story quoted critic Dwight McDonald as saying that the case was an outright persecution. And Newsweek also quoted me, quoting four lines from William Blake, which went as follows. Children of the future age, reading this indignant page, know that in a former time, love, sweet love, was thought a crime. Well, the case was over. I was uh, pretty bitter. And I began to think about uh, all the other areas in which the press has been deficient in American life. It's fair to point out the corruption in business, the shenanigans of politics, the callousness to the abridgment of individual rights. And by God, I decided I was going to come back from the ashes and from the mat and bring, back a, and bring out another magazine whose sole purpose would be to fill the void created by the American press. And just as Eros was an avant-garde magazine, perhaps too far ahead of its times, Fact would be a throwback to good old-fashioned crusading American journalism. And I sent out a prospectus, I wrote a prospectus describing the magazine, sent it out to a quarter of a million people, and I'd like to quote to you from it. It showed a newsboy crossed out and said, the American press is no longer the voice of the people. And it read as follows. American journalism has grown fat and lazy. The scoop, the expose, and the fiery editorial have virtually disappeared. In 96% of American cities, the daily newspapers are controlled by a single ownership, which in many cases also owns local radio and TV. 
Today we have only half the number of newspapers we had in 1900, despite a tripling of the population since then. During the same period of time, our wire services have dwindled from 12 to a mere two. Today's magazines, the bloodless progeny of such journalistic titans as Garrison's Liberator and Mencken's American Mercury, shrink from controversy and print only those articles which they know will please advertisers and preserve revenues. The opportunity for the dissenting voice to be heard for the unpopular cause to be championed has vanished from free America. We live in the age of managed news, of journalistic indolence, of press agentry, of government censorship. Never in history has such widespread complacency and corruption of the press prevented the public from reading the facts it must have in order to function as a government by the people. Today's magazines and newspapers are a mockery of the Jeffersonian concept of American democracy as safeguarded by a watchdog press. And then I said, as a partial antidote to this threat to the democratic process, we're proud to announce publication of fact. Fact is predicated upon a fierce belief in democracy and an incessant yearning for simple honesty. It will be America's permanent roving Diogenes peering into the halls of legislature, the ateliers of art, the archives of history, and the laboratories of science, sifting from pitchmen's bally to and politicians can't the fact. Fact will be a fearless magazine beholden neither to advertiser nor to vested interest. It will not hesitate to ask, where are the emperor's clothes? And we presented, and we listed a lot of the articles that we were then preparing, and many of which have since been printed, including an article on Catholic appropriation of federal funds, a story on a suppressed government report on car safety, the dangers of, of Coca-Cola, etc. And the dedication page of our first issue carried the following dedication. Fact is dedicated to the proposition that a great magazine in presenting the truth will dare to offend not only big business, not only the church, not only the state, but if necessary, its own readers. And we printed our first issue. The cover story was titled Time, the Weekly Fiction Magazine. <laughs> and in it, we presented statements from approximately 35 world-renowned figures, Bertrand Russell, Erwin Shaw, Sloan Wilson, Igor Stravinsky, Tallulah Bankhead, Mary McCarthy, Dwight McDonald, David Merrick, Eugene Burdick, Howard Fast, James Gould Cousins, Walter Winchell, John Osborne, Eric Bentley, H. Allen Smith, Taylor Corwell, Senator John McClellan, telling how they too had been shafted by time. <laughs> during the nine months that, and that, of course we commenced publication only at the beginning of this year. Now during the nine months that fact has been in publication, it's gotten quite a bit of attention. It's been the subject of literally hundreds of editorials, sermons, newspaper reports, speeches in Congress. It's even inspired a bill or two in some legislatures. Fact is also inspired imitation, I'm happy to say. We had a big blast at Detroit for building uncrashworthy cars, and this has spawned a number of similar articles in other magazines. Most important, we did a big piece on Madeleine Murray, the lady who won the Supreme Court case banning prayer from public school, and this story was picked up by Time, Life, Post, Esquire, and a half a dozen other imitators. Life even went so far as to swipe our title, the most hated woman in America. Now, when fact commenced publication, most editors and publishers in New York did not believe it would succeed commercially. They thought its editorial conception was okay, but they doubted that, that there was a sufficient number of nonconformists and intellectuals throughout the country to sustain a magazine which refuses to take advertising. Well, I'm pleased to say that the experts were wrong. Fact circulation figures have boggled our wildest expectations. We expect the sale of our current issue to exceed a quarter of a million copies. To translate that into meaningful figures for you, in eight months, our magazine has grown bigger than New Republic, National Review, Nation, Progressive, New Leader, bigger even than The Reporter. And we are now running neck and neck with Atlantic and Harper's. However, as with Eros, fact has not been without its censorship difficulties. Right here in LA, for example, we can't get an ad into the LA Times. And when we run an ad in the Herald Examiner, they literally censor it, cut out certain parts and emasculate it. In a city just south of Los Angeles, we can't get the local distributor to handle the magazine at all. And in another city nearby, the distributor won't put the magazine on newsstands till he has shown a copy to the chief of police. Even right here and now, on this platform, I have been asked not to talk about a certain subject. 
I had planned to release from this platform the results of a survey which fact made of all of America's psychiatrists on the psychological fitness of Barry Goldwater to serve as president. But the university asked me not to do so, and I've made other arrangements to hold a press conference at the Beverly Hilton immediately after this talk. <laughs> Despite these censorship difficulties, fact is succeeding. I look forward to the day when it will be not the largest, but perhaps the most influential magazine in the country. And I also look forward to, and I'm confident of, the eventual revival of Eros. Thank you. Finally, for you who are about to go out into your professions and out into the Peace Corps and down to Mississippi to get votes for the Negroes, uh, there may just possibly be one lesson for you to be learned from my brief career as a publisher, and it is this. Don't ever, ever sell out on your ideals, and don't let the bastards grind you down. <laughs> We'll take about two minutes to let you get to your classes. Those who wish to remain to ask questions, Mr. Ginsburg will answer questions. Now we have an opportunity to entertain questions. Gentleman in the blue shirt, please. May I rephrase the question for those that have not heard it? I hope I can rephrase it reasonably accurately. The question asked Mr. Ginsburg to compare his operations with that of the Grove Press. And I take it the purport of the question is whether or not Mr. Ginsburg's operations have been largely motivated by commercial objectives rather than artistic objectives. Mr. Ginsburg. Well, I'm sorry that I, I failed to make that clear in the address. Uh, Yes, I regard my publishing uh, activities as as noble as those of Bonnie Rossett, who was certainly a noble publisher. And uh, if you were inside my company and you saw how money was spent, I guess you could decide for yourself whether or not we are out for a fast buck or out to produce something worthwhile. As for uh, having everything we do, uh, you seem to think that everything we do is a surefire commercial success, I pointed to two successes. Uh, you know, not everything we do is sure fire, and if any man can predict what is sure fire, uh, he's going to he's going to be a wealthy fellow. Uh, I'm sorry, but I don't. I just don't think your question is all that pointed, and I don't know that I ought to say any more in answer to it. Another question, please, this gentleman down here.
May I suggest that the question is not relevant to the topic, and because we do not desire this platform to be used for political purposes, partisan political purposes particularly, I'd prefer to entertain another question now. This gentleman down here. The well, question is, is Fact Magazine a collection of opinion facts or factual facts? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that I understand the difference between opinion facts and objective facts, since not all facts are scientifically measurable. And uh, I, I say that there's an awful lot of opinion in Fact Magazine. And in collecting and presenting what you might regard as objective factual data, one exercises a great deal of opinion. Therefore, my magazine is not totally without bias, if that's what you'd like to hear me say. It is not. OK. Uh, however, I think we get at the germ of truth to a greater degree than almost any of the other larger magazines in this country in pointing up the issues of our times. And uh, well, I think, I hope that answers your question. I think also this business of objectivity, like the New York Times likes to pretend it has, is really a myth, and any working newsman knows that. Thank you. Let's take another question over here, this gentleman in the rear. I think we can get an yeah. answer to that. I think you're right that, that the decision. <laughs> but I really did pledge that I wouldn't discuss it here, and I'm not going to. But you're right. All right. This gentleman down here, please. The question is, to what extent was Attorney General Kennedy personally active in the prosecution against Mr. Ginsburg? To the extent that he personally decided to uh, revive this archaic criminal statute and uh, to proceed against me with it. And I know this for a fact because following the conviction, I went down to Washington and discussed the matter with a very high official in the criminal division of the Justice Department. I might add, by the way, that I don't claim to be a friend of Bobby Kennedy, but I have met him on a number of occasions, and I have a couple of dear Ralph letters from him, and I once spent a day with him, him and the late president and the late president's father when I did an article, which was highly commending of the Kennedy family, as a matter of fact. Um, and following the conviction, I met him at a luncheon for the Fund for the Republic in New York, and I approached him and said, uh, gee, uh, you know, what about this? What, what gives you? And uh, <laughs> he refused to discuss the matter. Yes, uh, question in the rear. Ge no, the gentleman with the glasses. Sorry. Do you believe that the, the laws under which you were convicted is unconstitutional? If so, uh, can you prove it? Question relates to whether Mr. Ginsburg believes the law under which he was convicted is unconstitutional and what grounds for such belief, if any, he may have. I'm glad you asked that question. I think I can prove that. To answer your question, yes, all obscenity statutes are unconstitutional. For the following reason, it's as simple as ABC. The Constitution says, and I think I'm almost uh, literally quoting it, that Congress, and the professor can correct me, that Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of the speech or of the press. Now, it does not particularize and say, this is true for running a college, conducting a political campaign, flying a jet plane, uh, or how to build a building, it's true for everything but sex. The Constitution didn't say that. It said, clearly, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of, sp of speech or of the press. And as a matter of fact, during the first hundred years of our nation, there were no such laws as, as obscenity statutes as we understand them today. They came into full flower following the Civil War, when the United States the United States had gone through a traumatic experience in the Civil War, and it was a great moral revival, and everybody was singing the battle hymn of the Republic, and the Salvation Army was created, and the YMCA's. 
And uh, everybody started being afraid of sexual expression and recognizing the fact that man too is an animal. In fact, animal was the worst opprobrium you could cast at anybody during Victorian times. And, uh, and so it, it was only then that the obscenity statutes came into being when our country was already one century old. I might uh, interject, if I may, the point that uh, Mr. Ginsburg's position on this is uh, strongly supported by a minority on the United States Supreme Court, namely, or principally led by Mr. Justice Black. Uh, as a prediction of long-term future law, he may have a, a greater justification for his position. This gentleman here. The question is, in publishing Eros, what criteria did Mr. Ginsburg use in distinguishing between pornography and art? You know, there's no such thing as an objective criterion by which one measures art. I can only say that my own taste was the touchstone by which the magazine's artistic taste was governed. More accurately, I should say, by the, at least in text. In the graphics, it was largely determined by my brilliant art director, Herb Luballin, of whom I mentioned, I uh, spoke quite a bit earlier. Thank you. Any other? Uh, gentleman back there, please, in the white shirt. Yes. The question is whether Mr. Ginsburg knows what percentage of his subscribers take these magazines for their literary quality uh, rather than for their uh, controversial qualities. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> question, gentlemen, over in the wall. The question relates to the extent to which Mr. Ginsburg has encountered similar opposition, picketing, and the like, particularly by religious groups, in connection with speeches of this sort that he's given elsewhere. Well, the answer is I've only been invited to speak on one other campus, and that was my alma mater, CCNY in New York. Uh, about 90 percent of the students there are Jewish, so we didn't run into that problem. <laughs> but, you know, you raise a very interesting point uh, in pointing out that, in effect, and if you really stop to give a lot of thought to this subject, you have to come to the inescapable conclusion that the forces of religion are really antithetic to those of uh, a, a more liberal attitude toward sex. Uh, my own feeling is that the decision of the Catholic Church in Rome the other day to, to permit married deacons uh, to play a more vigorous role in the church uh, are an indication of the inexorable decline of the power of religion on people. I mean, my own belief is that religion is very important to many people. It, it provides an avenue for expression of certain drives that uh, don't find another sublimated way to be expressed. But uh, by and large, there's a, there are healthier ways to uh, solve one's personal problems than by religious devotion, and I am confident that uh, eventually more of the world will look toward those solutions for the resolution of their personal problems. Yes. Uh, young lady right here. Yes. The question relates to whether Mr. Ginsburg's statements in his talk tended to indict the journalistic fraternity or, I suppose, the publishing fraternity, uh, and whether he has received support for his position from the associations uh, of journalists. 
No journalistic organization of any kind or any organization of publishers, not the Magazine Publishers Association or the Book Publishers Council or any of the big powerful publishing organization, despite numerous entreaties, has lifted so much as a pinky in behalf of my predicament. Uh, as for the working newsmen, they're no better and no worse than craftsmen in any other trade. It's been my lifetime experience that competence of an organization comes from the top. And if, if for example, you had five newsmen from five different media competing against one another to get the best story on any given scene, you would end up with a much better quality of performance by each of those men than you would have when the five of them, or as usually happens today, there's just one guy, combine and uh, uh, combine facilities and there's, there's just no great need for these people to scurry. You know, one of the theories of, the, of this country and the reason it has come as far as it has in 200 years is that uh, we believe that when men compete against each other, the greatest amount of good results for the greatest number of people. Well, we don't have that in journalism anymore. As I think I pointed out, 96%, in 96% of American cities, the papers are owned by a single newspaper. And uh, why, should, why should the publisher of such a newspaper rock the boat on an advertiser when he can play it safe, avoid controversy, print news of church teas, and keep everybody relatively happy, you know? Question. Uh Gentleman in the back with a red shirt. The question, if you didn't hear it, related to Mr. Ginberg's opinion as to how Playboy happens to be permitted to go through the mails where the speaker or the questioner believes that Playboy is in certain ways much more suggestive and erotic than Eros? Well, the answer is that uh, Playboy had its day in court. It was uh, one of its first issues was banned. It fought a post office case. It wasn't a criminal action, you see. This was before Bobby Kennedy's new wrinkle. And the post office just tried to prevent its entrance into the mail, and it lost. Um, and of course, once a publication beats the post office, the post office uh, is not likely to attack it again. Now, of course, but Playboy does continue to have, as you may know, uh, occasional local actions, but nothing on the grand scale, you know, the grand criminal federal prosecution scale of the Eros case. Now, to answer your question about do I think it's a more erotic book than Eros, uh, it wasn't nearly as specific as Eros was, but as I think I said to you, I think it does have, you know, a little more of that leer and guilt, guilty uh, aura about much of its presentation. There's an, a lot more flesh in Playboy than there was in Eros, but a lot more things were specifically said in Eros than in Playboy. Yes, uh, question, uh, let's see a gentleman on the first row here. Yes, there was. Would you comment on the literary uh, value of that article? The question relates to an article that appeared in Eros relating to a sex store in Japan. Right. And asked Mr. Ginsburg yeah. to comment on the it. The article was titled, My Quest for a French Tickler in Japan. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a great story by a very hip New York dame who went to Japan. And before she left, someone had dared her to pick one up in Japan, and she told how she managed to do so and to bring it back through customs. Was it a great work of literature? No. Was it an interesting reading? I think it was. Another question. Gentleman in the white shirt, or the white coat. question relates to a recent issue of Eros that portrayed relationship on an interracial basis between man and woman and asked for comment on this particular article. I think you make a very good point and to answer your question, yes, in this issue of Eros we ran a series of photographs called black and white in color. 
And what they did was show an interracial couple in various, I don't know how much, if any, of this you can see. And we ran some, just some figure studies of an interracial couple. And the doctor is quite right that the thing that seemed to really get the judge steamed up more than anything else was this series of photographs at which he carried on at great length in his opinion. And it's been said to me that if we had made the chick colored and the guy white, nothing would have happened. Question down here. As I gather, the question asks <laughs> whether Mr. Ginsburg would take a position in favor of publication of hardcore pornography, and, and why have the distinction between hardcore pornography and something less than that? The answer is that if we had an intelligent society view on sex, what you're suggesting would be the prevailing state of affairs. That is to say, you would need no justification for sex. Sex needs no justification, period. It's the instinct of life itself. Now, um, you, you, there was a second part to your question, which skips me. Uh, I was wondering if there's any standard for responsibility in the future that could happen. It's inevitable. <laughs> and you know what? And when it's done, I hope it's done that the pornography is done artfully, that we really do put are great talents to this subject. I mean, it's just too bad that sex is such a guilt-ridden topic in society today. Uh, this uh, gentleman in the blue shirt, please. The questioner recalls that in the talk, Mr. Ginsburg indicated that Cardinal Spellman may have been one of those who opposed the publication of Eros and asked whether Mr. Ginsburg knows if this was a position taken officially on behalf of the church or as an individual. What I said was that possibly through Cardinal Spellman's offices, Bobby Kennedy was brought into the picture. And the reason I said this was because at a, a communion breakfast, which he sponsored in New York, the, the state chairman of the Citizens for Decent Literature really took off at me. And so we know that there was at least that much of a link between the Citizens for Decent Literature and the New York Archdiocese. I have absolutely no hard evidence that Cardinal Spellman was involved, although I would not be surprised someday to learn that that were the case, since the Cardinal has very strong feelings about sex and print and just recently triggered off a big new anti-smut drive in New York City. Uh, question the gentleman back here, please, with the coat on. Yes. Dr. Walter Barton, director of the American Psychiatric Association, has presented you in Fact Magazine for this questionnaire with you. May I suggest that this is the topic? My question does mm -hmm. not involve these. All right. I wonder if you feel that you as a reporter should be considered ethical by members of the professional association. I would suggest that this topic comes very close to the topic on which Mr. Ginsburg will be holding a press conference this afternoon. I don't believe that his ethics would come under this. I, he was going to talk on the uh, questionnaire, not on his own ethics. I will take responsibility for ruling this question out of order. There's another question back here. I would suggest this be addressed by letter to Mr. Ginsburg so that he can give you that specific information that is not of general interest. He wanted specific issues of magazines that have been referred to. Uh, down here. Do you believe every aspect of life has to be covered in the press? The question is, does Mr. Ginsburg believe that every aspect of life should be covered in the press as vividly as in his magazines? The answer is absolutely. Uh, the only way to deal with life is uh, to understand it and to find out. You can't deal with a problem unless you square up to it. And uh, to answer your question, yes, I think every aspect of life has a rightful place in the literature of our times. We have time for just one more question. This gentleman in the green sweater right here.
The question is, Mr. Ginsburg, at the conclusion of his talk, asked his audience to be true to themselves. In the light of the censorship under which he is laboring on this platform, how does he, uh, or would he comment on this observation of his? The answer is that no one, no matter how principled, can go through life having every last thing precisely as he would like to have it be. And I guess when I made that statement, I was suggesting a mark toward which to shoot and to come as close to it as you possibly can. I capitulated on that point here today, and I plead guilty to that. Thank you very much.